Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth installment, our final installment of the series on Beis Yaakov and Sarashnir, Tradition and Revolution, the story of the Beis Yaakov movement. I'm going to post the link to the source sheet in the chat, and then I will share my screen at some point as well. Um, and feel free, if you aren't able to open it, let me know. Um, Okay, so um, I'm very excited actually tonight. I would like to discuss a few things we haven't covered yet. And then I would like to reflect more on the general question of let's say women's role. And as I titled the, the content of uh, the, um, the title of this um, lecture series is tradition and revolution. And I wanna talk a little bit about sort of this duality that we see in Sarashnir herself, and perhaps um, where the movement went and how Besiako functions today very differently than perhaps it did in the interwar period that we were discussing. Okay, so the first thing I want to discuss uh, with you tonight is um, the Besiako journal. So let me share my screen and I'll show you a, a few things about the Beis Yaakov journal. This is just a picture of Beis Yaakov, uh, I think it was from Krakow, but I don't, I'm not, I don't remember. Um, so the Beis Yaakov journal was a publication that was published through the central offices of Beis Yaakov and the Aguda. It was edited by Rabbi Eliezer Gershon Friedensen, who we mentioned a couple of times he was a Ger Chassid. He was one of the Talmud of the Ger Rebbe. He took a very active role in the Beis Yaakov central offices. And it appeared monthly, sometimes even more than that, from between the year of 1923 to 1939. And here you see a picture of the first issue of the Beis Yaakov Journal, 1923. This is the front page. And what's fascinating about the Beis Yaakov Journal is and I don't know how to read Yiddish, so I'm utilizing Naomi Seidman's scholarship here, which we're, God willing, going to have an opportunity to hear from ourselves on uh, April 3rd at uh, 10.30 a.m. We're going to have an interview with her, um, myself, and Rabbi Karabkin, uh, interviewing Naomi Seidman, the author of this book. So very excited for that. She actually lives, uh, lives in Toronto. Um, so she, she really has a whole um, network um, an online uh, resource called the uh, Beis Yaakov Project. And in there, she goes through, and as well in her book, some of the um, journal and, 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 you know, and, and, and sort of lays out what a lot of the different articles and different appearances of questions and, and different uh, letters to the editors and sort of shows this diversity and openness that we were discussing about, uh, earlier in the movement. So, the first journal, the first um, issue of the journal, it included um, often, it would, and this was true for many of the issues, it would include a reflection by Rosara Schneer. It would also often include a piece uh, from Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch. And we mentioned him a few times. He was um, very influential on in Sarah Schneer's uh, own per personal religious life and in the movement itself, his approach to uh, both tradition, but also an openness towards the culture of the world. And they would often, they would also often have an advice column in the journal called Sister to Sister. And they would also have book reviews, announcements about Beis Yaakov events, talk different Benos groups, uh, different, uh, you know, births, uh, engagements, simchas, advertisements, and letters to the editors. Um, and one, one thing that I, I wanted to, to show you is the range of open discussion that the journal had. And this is, this is uh, the first source that I have over here from Naomi Seidman, which was written by uh, Esther. I, I don't know if this, that was her real name or if it was a pen name, but this is from Naomi Seidman's book. The, uh, this, this woman, Esther, so she wrote this, this, this letter um, discussing, and the editor sort of posed different questions um, and 
got a lot of different responses from the readers of the of the journal. And uh, this one girl, I don't know, I don't know her age, girl, woman, uh, wrote that uh, basically raising certain, raising certain uh, frustrations and uh, uh, you know certain um, hesitations that she had about her identity or in general a you know uh, the contemporary woman's identity. And here I'm going to read a few words from her piece. This is a citation from her translation, citation from her letter. And no wonder Jewish life is tangled and torn with different ideas and contradictory worldviews pushing against each other, even in a single family circle. The father, a chassid, the mother, a pious woman, one daughter belongs to Benos, and the second is a Zionist or a Bundist or a member of such of some other religious movement. And what is one supposed to do in such a case? She talks about this fr- struggle that, that we have in our community, such a devotion and our deep sense of family and kinship and community. And, um, you know, this, uh, I think the issue that was raised in the journal was how do we relate to people who are no longer religious or people who are antagonistic to religion? And she's raising that it could even be in one family itself. So first of all, we see a window into that society that we see, you know, we think that we uh, in our community, we have, you know, off the derech and people straying from the paths. And, you know, although there are new challenges in our generation, but they, they had similar challenges in, in, you know, sort of the good old days as well that, you know, and, and what I think is fascinating is that the journal, uh, which Simon notes, makes no recommendations, merely complimenting the participants for their intelligence and sensitivity and facing these issues squarely. So the wrote these issues, they expressed their, um, you know, um, confusion with the struggle in a, you know, in a family unit, identifying and, 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 you know, coming to it, to one's own Jewish identity within the context of a family, which has many, many different voices. And it wasn't as though it was like censored and it wasn't as though, you know, that we give this, this is the Torah answer and, and, and that's it. It was, it was an open dialogue. Um, now, of course, even this open dialogue had its limits. And um, there, uh, there was in sort of an autobiographical piece by the same woman, Esther. And she discusses um, that when she went to a small town based Yaakov chapter, the group was not happy with her. And we, well, let, let's see um, you know, how she describes her exposure to this group and, uh, and, and, and we can see sort of that, that, that push then that, uh, that dichotomy between being open, but also sort of reigning in the dialogue. So here she writes, first of all, I oppose what was being said there too frequently. She was, I guess she was against what they were saying in the group too much. We had a certain freedom to speak out, but this wasn't what they had in mind. Rather than envision the Talmudic argumentation of the good old days in the yeshivas, First of all, fascinating that she's, again, um, you know, this is sort of a, uh, what we've been discussing in the previous uh, few, uh, you know, shiurim, that the comparison between yeshiva and the Beis Yaakov movement. So she's even calling it like this Talmudic argumentation, where even a certain number of questions regarding the outside world were discussed. But all this was used as a means of showing that our way was everlasting, that our way was correct, that we were God's chosen people. So in a sense, she's reflecting on the way in which the dialogue was, was had and the way in which this group wanted it to go. And, and, you know, we'll discuss things, but it has to be sort of a, you know, showing how the from way and the Jewish way and the religious way is superior. Um, so there were these, these like narrowing or cultural uh, sort of limits on the dialogue as well. But what's fascinating is if you look in the journals and different articles, they cover topics like Gandhi, Tolstoy, Pascal, Shylock legends, different fascinating things. Um, I saw, I looked into a particular uh, writer. His name was uh, Shmuel Nadler, a very interesting character who was close with the Aguda movement, was a poet of, of sorts, wrote uh, a, a tribute to the Baal Shem Tov, but then uh, left orthodoxy seemingly abruptly and uh, committed himself to the Bundist movement and other movements and went to France. And he was at one point published in the Beis Yaakov Journal. 
So you have these very interesting, um, you know, little, I would say, windows into a world in which there was sort of this, as I mentioned, these different, these different values that's happening. We're, we have a revolution in a sense. On the one hand, you know, women are writing, they're reading, they're becoming more vocal, and that's new. And they're also questioning how they're supposed to uh, determine their own identity. On the other hand, in the, in, in the journal, there's also sort of this uh, influence on creating what the, what the correct um, and what the Jewish way and, and showing that that's, that is, uh, that is you know, superior. So it's, very, it's a very interesting um, sampling of sort of that, their, their lifestyle and their culture and what the issues that they were dealing with. Um, we can spend a lot more time, and, and, and Simon does in her book about the journal, but I just thought I would um, just mention a few of those pieces. And, um, and then I wanted to also talk a little bit about Beis Yaakov in America. So Beis Yaakov in America was founded by Vichna Kaplan. Her maiden name was Eisen. And Vichna Eisen Kaplan married Rabbi Baruch Kaplan. And they together started the first uh, Beis Yaakov High School in Williamsburg in 1938 in her living room. Now, what's fascinating, I've mentioned her before, she was very close with the Briskarov, Rav Yitzhak Zev Soloveitchik, and she started Beis Yaakov in, um, in Brisk. Um, and she had a vision, even before she was married, even before she had moved to America, because the whole story how she got to America is very interesting that the uh, the shidduch that was read to her, that was suggested to her <coughs> by the family, insisted that she move to America. So the whole idea that she was moving to America was it came, you know, sort of abrupt. <laughs> but she had this vision even before she got married that she would start a base yako, and she got permission from the central office, and she started this uh, this school, and it grew. And in 1944, it became an all an all day high school. It wasn't just in her, you know, in her living room. And at a certain point in the 40s, Rabarak Kaplan, who was a a, a magid chair at Yeshiva's Torah Badas, he left his position to become this school administration administrator. And they together, I don't know, um, it was very, you know, I don't know exactly what they were making. Money was very tight, and they had a large family, and they took on the responsibility, financial responsibility, the um, recruiting, because no one wanted to send their daughters, really. They was all, you know, they were sending to public schools and they really made this push and they started this movement. Now, there were other schools, uh, girls' schools in America at the time. It should be noted that in 1944, uh, Joseph Breuer um, had his, you know, girls' school based on the Frankfurt model um, from his grandfather of Shamshin Fall Hirsch. And there were all also all there were also other um, different Lubavitch schools in America, but they were few and far between. And Vichna Kaplan, along with her husband Baruch Kaplan, they really uh, sort of opened up the floodgates and began, and started this you know this movement which grew throughout North America tremendously. Um, and uh, in 1958, they opened up. The Borough Park branch of Beis Yaakov, which eventually, became the, you know, larger and, and 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 even superseded the Williamsburg branch, um, and uh, she was a student of Sarah Schneer. She was very close with her, and just as we mentioned, the culture of Sarah Schneer's attachment to nature, to theater and production and singing. So too, the way that, uh, and, and these summer retreats. So Vichna Kaplan also um, incorporated many of the, uh, I would say the cultural uh, successes that Sarah Schneer saw in Poland, in Krakow, she brought them to America. One of the things she started was a summer camp. So they um, started a summer camp in 1944, founded by Rav Avram Newhouse. And um, they, they followed a very similar, um, structure, although, as we will know uh, in, in a later piece in this uh, shir, the general tone of the Bisiakov movement was beginning to change. It was no longer this revolution, this, uh, you know, sort of breaking from the, um, you know, the identity of 
the society in which they lived in and defining a new Jewish woman and a new culture. It was more about maintaining the, uh, the community and it became more of an institutional um, reality, which is a true, for me, as we, I think we said, is about many movements. They begin with this you know, uh, inspiration, charismatic leadership that sort of defies the norm. Then if it's to succeed, it has to become an institution. It has to have sort of the checks and balances and the systematization, systematization and the routinization. It has to sort of become uh, a, a structured, organized entity in order to succeed. So that is what we see in a very, very, uh, you know, short, short and, um, you know, abbreviated, we see this progression with the Besiago movement and specifically in the Besiago movement in America, where it's founded by Vichna Kaplan, it begins as a, sort of the same cultural reality and then sort of morphs into a post-war, um, more conservative, more maintaining its institutional um, uh, structures. Now, I want to, uh, we'll get back a little bit to that change and what happened there, but I would like to generally reflect on the Beis Yaakov movement, these changes, and, and as I mentioned, what was Sarah Schneer's vision and this sort of dichotomy between her traditional sensibilities, but also her revolutionary tendencies. So that's what I'd like to spend most of tonight on. And um, I would, I'll begin with another student of, of Sarah Schneer, this is uh, Dr. Judith Grunfeld, who originally was Rosenbaum. So she actually notes the similarities between Hasidic life and, uh, and the Beis Yaakov culture. And she argues that in a sense, Sarah Schneer became sort of like a Hasidic Rebbe of, uh, of these women. And she writes, make this a little larger. Here among the girls, the inspiration of the Hasidic life had found its way into the women's world. It had formed its own style, softened and differently molded, but it was of the same fiber that made the Hasidim crowd round the Rebbe, made them stand for hours to catch a glimpse of him, made them unfold all their latent powers in the elevated atmosphere of Hasidic devotion. No longer was the life of the Jewish daughter empty at home. Remember that citation of Sarah Schneer that the men are all going off to the Rebbe, they're all going off on the train and we stay home on yes. Uh, we don't know what to do and we're just as empty and, and, you know. So she says, no longer is the life of a Jewish daughter empty at home. She too had her community life, her school, her center and club where there were com comradeship and studies and well-organized activities an outlet and a spur for her eager ambitions. So we see that it was very important to the movement that they created sort of these social clubs and these places where they could be, and it, you know, they still have it today, you know, productions and, and, uh, you know, just places for them to get, you know, to have sort of these gatherings and just to have social, you know, connection um, outside of the home, that it was a very key element in the movement. And, and, you know, Grunfeld calls it almost similar to a Hasidic crowd how they would want to just take a glimpse of her and try to, you know, just to be close to each other and 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 um, and get sort of a, um, a circle around her and 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 try their best to achieve and to utilize their strengths for the movement. It's interesting. Um, there's a whole discussion when it comes to Hasidus. What was the traditional role of a woman within Hasidus. So let's go back a hundred years. It was assumed within the Hasidic movement that the men were the Hasidim of the Rebbe. Women were, and I'm not saying this is correct or incorrect, I'm just, that, that was sort of the, the cultural way that they looked at it. The women were like, you know, she was the wife of this person or she was the mother of the, right? She wasn't her own Hasid of the Rebbe in a sense. So Sarah Schneer, although she was from a Bell's uh, background, but she herself wasn't seen as a chassid of the Bell's Rebbe. And only later, if I'm not uh, mistaken, this is what I saw in, the, uh, in, in, in Simon's book, the first, actually no, this was Yehuda Geber who pointed this out, 
that the first Hasidus to argue for a woman being her own Hasid of the Rebbe was actually Lubavitch. Lubavitch, starting with the uh, with the Rebbe, uh, um, the, the Rayats, the Rayats, he was he argued before the the most uh, the, the last Lubavitch Rebbe. He wanted women to feel that that they are Hasidim of the Rebbe. They are their own sort of individual. Um, but previous to that, it wasn't heard of. So what, what we see in the Beis Yaakov movement was, although they didn't um, sort of take on the identity of Hasidim, of any particular Hasidus, right? Beis Yaakov wasn't like bells, it wasn't gear, it wasn't, it wasn't even Yekish, right? It was its own culture. But in a sense, they utilized some of the strengths of the close-knit relationship that many of them may have had seen or been exposed to that they saw that men had and they, I don't know if it was conscious, probably not so conscious, but they sort of rallied around Sarashnir in the same cultural way that Hasidim would, 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 would rally around their Rebbe. So it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon that they sort of, sort of created this subculture within the, the movement. Similar but you know, somewhat different, but another interesting um, perspective on the relationship that the Sarashnir students have with her and the general you know, culture of the movement was the idea of Sarashnir being almost as a mother or a grandmother, but sort of a kin and establishing not only a, uh, a, a school, but rather a sort of a lineage so this is a, uh, a citation here. Um, this is another, uh, something that Dr. Uh, Judith Rosenbaum, later Grunfeld, notes that she was married to um, Dr. Isidore Grunfeld, who was a Dian, and he was a, uh, a very well, um, you know, uh, he had a many things that he did. He was a translator of Shams Rafael Hirsch's uh, work, and he was a prominent rabbi. But... Grunfeld uh, reflects on the fact that when she would meet a group of girls and she told them about her husband, they really didn't care much. But when they told, when she said that I was a student or of Sar of Sarah Schneer, then they were very, very impressed. And she just talks about how Sarah Schneer uh, was not just someone who started a school system, but she started, this is a, a new form, I'm reading, quoting from the book, a new form of social status, kinship, and yichus within the Orthodox world. One passed on from one woman to another between teacher and student rather than parent and child. The line that began with Sarashnir has even reached granddaughters. And this is a, you know, um, there was a speech in 1992, so as recent as, you know, 30 years ago, that in a commemoration yard site for her, there was a speech that was made where the speaker said, I am her, referring to, um, Sarah Schneer, I am her grandchild through Vichna Kaplan. You, my Talmidos, my students, are her great grandchildren. So you see this idea of, you see this idea that Sarah Schneer was not only a teacher and she was not only sort of this founding uh, you know, figure, but she almost was like a creating a new lineage where people felt that. When, you know, when they were talking to Judith Grunfeld, they were talking to almost like her, in a sense, her family, her daughter, and they wanted to connect to her. And the way that they connected um, and the way that they identify with her was not just through their, um, you know, their knowledge, but they were sort of connecting to this institution on a familial level. That very much relates to what we were saying before um, about how the, the families at that time, and the, and the girls were talking about this in the journal, in the Beisach of journal, they were trying to find their identity. And Beisach of, by many different uh, avenues, whether it was the, the, the productions, the schooling, the singing, the davening, the learning, they were all ways in which these girls found their identity. They found sort of a new um, family. And they were able to, you know, identify as a Beis Yaakov girl. And even today you see, you know, sort of shades of that, that people say, oh, I'm a Beis Yaakov girl. And it's sort of like, it explains everything, but it, you know, it doesn't, 
it, it's sort of just assumed that you understand what that means. And it's sort of this connection. And even like my daughter, Sakovir, like she knows about Sarah Schneer. It's sort of like this, it's a it's a sort of a, a subculture within uh, within orthodoxy. So it's fascinating. So on what so just to recap, on one hand, it sort of bo- borrows from the model of Hasidus. And on the other hand, it's almost borrowing from the model of like a family unit. What I find fascinating is that this is not just an invention that happened later, that, you know, Sarah Schneer is like our mother, our grandmother, you know, through her students. Sarah Schneer herself adopted uh, a sort of a lineage through her teachers. And I want to show you what I mean. There's a very moving piece uh, in Sarah Schneer's um, diary where she talks about how she walks, she goes to Frankfurt. Frankfurt was the community where Shamshan Fall Hirsch, you know, uh, led his separatist, um, you know, uh, Torah Dar Harris community. And in, in the Beis Yaakov journal, Sarah Schneer describes in an article, I'm sorry, it wasn't a, 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 in her diary. She describes marveling at the involvement of the girls, right? She walked around and, and she saw that, that the, you know, that they went to the shuls and, she goes into, she describes herself going into the salon of, of Hirsch's grandchildren. I, I don't know how this is possible, but she walked in. She pages through the family album and she literally inscribes herself into the genealogy of Rav Hirsch's family. So let's see, she writes over here, the album was full of family memorabilia, but the last page was blank. I took my pen and wrote the following words. I know that it takes chutzpah for a stranger to insert themselves in someone else's family album. But when it comes to a spiritual mission, all the rules of polite society may be overthrown. Within these lines, let me let it be known that there is someone who carried on the work of a brilliant person. And she's referring to herself as carrying on the mission of Rav Sham Shirafal Hirsch. Now, I don't know if this is true or it's just dramatic for dramatic effect. I imagine she's being true. She was very, you know, generally an honest person. And you see that she literally inserts herself into his family because she saw herself as carrying on his spiritual, uh, you know, mission. So I don't, I don't know if this is happenstance um, that her students did the same thing for her in a sense, or perhaps when women who were no not ever recognized as part of a general Hasidus, they weren't recognized as part of the community in their own right. And they had to sort of redefine themselves. So they found different ways in which they identify with each other. And they sort of developed their own culture and their own identity um, distinct from the community in which they lived and distinct from their families because as many of them felt, their families didn't understand them as one of the letters written to the editor in the Beisach of Journal write that we'd rather discuss these issues with our friends because our parents don't understand us, sound very familiar to us, right? Mm-hmm. That kids don't feel the parents understand. What, whatever the reasons were, and there were many factors, it wasn't just sort of the denial of a Jewish education from the traditional institutions, it was Again, the weakness of the family units, the changing of the of the of you know sort of the landscape very quickly between the generations, and as I mentioned, sort of the lack of a place within these formal structures within Hasidus or within also the general you know Lithuanian communities that um, encouraged these girls to really embrace uh, their own community. So they really formed their own community. They found themselves. They saw themselves as daughters, as um, as granddaughters of Sarah Schneer and her students, and this, um, what I think, is a um, is an insight into how the movement was so successful and how it sort of built its own subculture so successfully um, within Orthodoxy. Now, let's transition a little bit into what Beis Yaakov is more like today. So I, I, I mentioned this before, um, but, you know, we, we, we see a general trend that was, became more established 
that what and, and we we were discussing that you know when it comes to modern or we'll call it more contemporary base Yaakovs, the revolutionary tone and the sort of breaking from the system is not as uh, commonly found. Um, but I think that the the, the, the traditional um, emphasis and the revolutionary trend, I think were both incorporated even from the beginning of the movement. So we had, you know, sort of these dual values. On the one hand, Sarah Schneer starts the movement her, on her own. As we mentioned, she does get the blessing of the Belzareva, but it, it was a very much grassroots movement. On the other hand, we saw the success of the movement came, um, you know, most, I don't want to say mostly, but it really got off the ground with the Aguda and the Gerareva getting involved. So, you know, if we were to just look at it, um, hindsight is twenty twenty. But if we want to reflect on what the movement teaches us, I, I want to maybe, you know, sort of bottom line a few a few points we can take away from it. So, takeaway number one, I would say, is that we see the power of the individual, right? The, 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 you know, Sarah Schneer and her ability to change the landscape tremendously, and we also see the importance of the partnership between the individual and the community, because without, you know, the, um, without the power and the support of the Aguda and the central basic of offices, which were very, you know, influenced by uh, the institutions and the, the Gera Hasidim and the Gera Rebbe, the, we, you know, I don't know if, if Beisach would have been successful. So fundamentally, um, you see that there has to be a partnership at a certain level between the lay leadership and the, the rabbinate, and between the individuals and the, uh, and the establishment. Now, I'm, you know, I would just give a caveat to, to anything I'm saying here is I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty new at this. I'm just learning this for, for, for you know, the first time. I'm exploring this topic. And something that really bothered me about this general storyline which is why did it take so long for the school to you know, get off the ground that women's Jewish, Jewish institutions didn't offer women uh, opportunities to learn? How, why did it take so long? We saw in 1903, right? There was this rabbinic conference and they mentioned the issues and nothing came, up, nothing came of it. And it really took you know, many, many years for the Beis Yaakov movement to get off the ground. So that was something that just personally bothered me. And I was searching to understand why were the why was the rabbinate and why were the um, why was the leadership against it or hesitant or didn't get its act together? Um, so I think this has to do with what we were saying before that there's sort of a, uh, a a tug of war that happens whenever you have a new institute, you know, sort of a new uh, movement, and the movement is often addressing an issue that that needs to be addressed. But the institution has to sort of make peace with this new reality. And part of that process is often rejection. So uh, just to illustrate the point more clearly, traditional Judaism is often very hesitant to change anything. So let's say women's Torah learning is our, our example, but there's many, many examples. Um, you know, we have sort of a very, um, conservative with a lowercase c approach to any changes, right? You want to come in and you, you want to change the curriculum for the schools. Well, why are we changing anything, right? There's sort of this, this initial knee-jerk reaction. Um, perhaps it's because of the Haskalah, the Enlightenment, which was, you know, taking people away from faith or in general, maybe it's just a, a general hesitant, uh, you know, nature for us to change our community structure. So that is generally, usually has served us well. You know, the traditional communities, Hasidus for sure, was one of the ways in which we combated the Haskalah and the Enlightenment. And it's helped us to maintain our, you know, our fealty to the tradition. If we just changed everything, you know, every year, it, you know, based on the trends, we would not exist. So it's certainly a good tendency to be hesitant for of change. However, 
And this, uh, this point I, I got from uh, one of my Rebbeim, Rav Aaron Lopiansky. He said, however, when it comes to the Beis Yaakov movement, the change happened too late. In other words, it mm-hmm. should have, because of our hesitance, because of the community's hesitance of changing anything, of making anything new, you know, that process took longer and it shouldn't have been that way. But that sort of is this the nature of changing anything within our community structure. It takes time because we're very uh, suspect of changing anything and making any, um, you know, uh, variance. And, you know, this was a new thing. So that was you know, the onus was sort of on the movement to prove itself, and it did prove itself. And with the partnership with the Aguda, it certainly was successful. Now, I wanted also just to quote a few points that I think, um, you know, support this idea of a balancing act between the community and the rabbinic leadership. So this is just, um, it's, I'm not going to go into the, all the details of the halacha, but I think it's a, it's a great example where the way in which the community responds to a particular decree is important. So this uh, comment is a comment from the Shulchan Aruch in source number six, and it is talking about pas akum, you know, bread that is made by a non-Jew. So the Shulchan Aruch writes that in some places they are, they are lenient, and those are times in which they can, uh, they can eat bread that is even made by a non-Jew when there's no Jew available. And then the Ramah writes in parentheses, V'yish omrim da'afilu b'makom she'pas Yisrael motzu shari. There are those that say that even when there is Jewish bread available, one may eat uh, from a non-kosher baker, a non-Jewish baker. And the Shach, who's one of the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, he explains this as follows. He quotes the Mordechai. He says, the places that had the custom to allow eating bread made by non-Jew, what was the reason? That the, for, the prohibition never became you know, public or it never... It never made it. It never became a thing in these places. And therefore, lo pashi yisuro b'chol yisrael. The, 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 the practice never got off the ground because it didn't, you know, it didn't gain traction. So I don't, this is not, this doesn't explain every halacha. Obviously, if people didn't keep Shabbos, that still doesn't mean that you don't have to keep Shabbos. And it, uh, there are certain areas that are absolutes. But there are certain things we see in halacha itself that if the community does not accept it, it doesn't become a prohibition. And therefore, I think we see that, yes, the, it's important that the, the, you know, the, having the rabbinic support or you know, and having, um, you know, going on a solitary crusade against the rabbinate doesn't, it's not going to, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's not really going to, uh, to work. At the same time, for the rabbinate to think that, has, that the community has no say, and the community is not important, and they can make all the decisions without having the support of the community is also wrong. So it's sort of this, this, uh, this balance that I'm, that I'm, as I study this story that I'm hoping uh, is, is uh, emerging through Sarah Schneer, is that you have to have both. You have to have a respect for what the community needs. You have to have an understanding of what the institution needs and why it's hesitant. You know, if, if a person is, you know, is just uh, not, not balancing these and not understanding the value of both, then I think, um, I think it, you know, as we see, it, it won't be successful. Um, this point is also made by Lins- Leslie Ginsburg Klein in source number eight. One of the most important lessons we can learn from Sarah Steyer is how to successfully and appropriately balance tradition and innovation. So she's talking, I think, more um, about the f- previous point, um, not necessarily on the rabbinate versus the, oh no, she is, she is, here. On the one end, Sarah Schneer was reconnecting girls with the past and reinstating tradition. Her students in Besiako publications stressed how she embodied traditional Jewish values, Shashat Snias, and followed Das Torah. 
On the other hand, Sarashnir went about reinstating tradition in a very modern way. She challenged convention after convention in a highly conservative society, right? She was, she, there were people who came out against her, right? The Munkat Rebbe, the Klonsberg Rebbe, the Satmar Rebbe, many people said, no, they sound not for us. It's too radical. It's too much of a revolution. We haven't done this. You know, uh, it's not right. And she she did it in a in a quiet, uh, a, you know, respectful way. But at the same time, she did challenge the very uh, institution in which uh, she functioned it. She called for change in an anti-innovation culture. That was what we were discussing before at this point from Rebbe Lopiansky, that our culture in general, our Jewish culture, uh, at least Perhaps you could argue it's a response to the to Haskalah or whatever it is. It's there. We are not so into innovation for the sake of innovation. Modest, radi radical, traditional, revolutionary. Can all these traits exist in one person? So she phrases it as a question. And I think it's also, besides for the question about this one person, I think it's also a question for us. Like, how do we understand, you know, the, ba the proper balance of these values? On the one hand, we see there are problems on the one end, you know, Sarah Schneer saw there were problems. And so how did she look at this? And how can we learn the best way to create, you know, change uh, while at the same time maintaining our Misora? So these are really like very live questions. So I would quote from, um, this is probably the best source besides for Sarah Schneer's own writing, which we'll see in a moment, this is probably the, the, the most explicit source that discusses this balance and the pro, you know, so what he sees as the way of a, uh, a from, you know, a balanced way for a Jewish Orthodox woman's role. So this is Dr. Leo Deutschlander's eulogy for Sarah Schneer. Um, okay. So Simon notes that it was, you know, Beis Yaakov was led by a woman who was unmarried and for most of the interwar period. Uh, she did get married later, but uh, most of the time she led it, she was unmarried. She did not play the role of a mother, daughter, or wife. I mean, she did in a sense, like we mentioned, but it wasn't the formal, you know, literal being a mother or wife. She led it as an activist, leader, and Torah giant. So this was not something that could not be addressed. And Dr. Leo Deutschlander, who I think we mentioned before, was very instrumental in the forming of, of the Karen uh, Hatora, which was the institution that he directed as the financial, um, you know, institution of the Aguda that helped with the um, support of the financial support of Beis Yaakov. So he said at her um, at her levaya, he made a uh, a eulogy, which is you know he worked very closely with her and it's a very emotional, very unique um, expression of how he saw Sarah Schneer's message and also her piety and how she was able to balance all these different um, seemingly contradictory values. So he, he says this, and this is going to, I imagine, evoke some feelings in, in different directions so I'm just warning you, it's, it, there's, a lot, there's a lot here. So he says as follows. How many times when arguing with Torah true men, with Hasidic fathers, this is a translation obviously from the Yiddish, um, with Hasidic fathers, with strict administrators, did she have to point to a medrash or cite a passage of the Talmud in order to substantiate her principles to build her school on healthy foundations? In other words, she, has to be, she had to be on the defensive. She had to defend her movement and say, hey, it's the, the rabbinic institution that you're, you know, that is so entrenched and not changing is not right. And she had to quote a medrash or a passage in the Gemara. More than once in defense of the purity of her movement, she was compelled to resort to manly stratagems. See, note, note that he's calling this manly stratagems, even though, you know, we see this as a whole movement of women learning, but he's still calling it manly stratagems, in order to properly respond in, in, to indifferent fathers or short-sighted administrators. This was certainly enough to make her feel her proper self-worth, to arouse her to fight the so-called degradations of women, her social class, her second class status. And then he says, she felt the full force 
like other women, she felt the full force of her relegation to the women's section of the synagogue, to the outer corners of the tent, to the segregation between men and women, the honor granted to the man in the Jewish home. You could have re read this, you know, in today, right? This is like mm -hmm. for many today. How strong must have been her desire to visit a Jewish cheder, to spend time in the yeshiva, sit at a Hasidic rabbi's table. I once, I saw this argument made um, in a re by a recent um, writer that women are told you have to have deference for the rabbis, but how many of them have interactions with them? How many of them are at their tables or at, you know? So this is literally, you know, still being discussed and trying to balance these uh, gender roles and the, and the value of women's Torah learning is still being discussed today. So, he, you know, he says she must have desired to be sit at the Rebbe's table, participate in important men's gatherings for those who were certainly, for her, the brightest places, the most cherished ideals. With how much light, how much spirit, how much enthusiasm would she have passed these experiences on to her students? After all, were these, were these men strangers or secular Jews? They were her own Jewish brothers, fervent to her Jews. So why should she be kept from hearing them, seeing them, participating in their life for the good of her ideals? Why should she, the historical personality, the famous figure, be kept within such strict limits, so undervalued? Why should that be? So he raises sort of these, these big questions. And we're expecting sort of the, uh, we're expecting him to come to a profound answer. But what Dr. Deutschlander says is that this, and this is what Simon says is the only possible answer to this painful conundrum for, you know, an Orthodox uh, a woman is that this is what Judaism requires. In other words, the way that, the way that he's formulating it, and you don't have to, you know, you, this is his opinion, is that Sarah Schneer ne did not feel that she was dissatisfied. She didn't feel she was, she was frustrated. He, and this is his interpretation of what she uh, stood for, was, and I'll, I'm quoting here, absolutely not. In other words, she did not uh, um, protest. Not a shred of dissatisfaction, not a hint of anger, not a trace of frustration. Was it possible to detect in her a kind of resignation, a sort of submission? Oh, well, what was there to be done about it? She was what she was, and there was no changing that. But no. So he's going back and forth. In other words, you would have thought that she would have sort of re resigned to submissing or submission to the Jewish value of, uh, you know, the separation of the genders, of the sexes. Perhaps it was a Tzniyas thing, it was, you know, but he said, no, she wasn't resigned. That's not who she was. There was no, no sign of the faintest clue that she was dissatisfied with her lot. And he says, no, like we say in the Torah, Baruch Ata Hashem, right? Shasani Kirtzono, right? That Hashem made me according to his will. So he sort of paints this picture. It's not really so clear. He begins talking about how, you know, she must have felt this yearning to be part of the, uh, you know, at the Rebbe's table and, and to, to learn with the, with the men and, and to, to see their, their religious personalities and to share that with their students. But he's saying at the same time, he never sensed that from her. He never got the feeling that she was um, resigning to that, to that role. And this is related to the other point that I made before about how, you know, in a sense, the Beis Yaakov movement in itself became sort of a more uh, typical, um, the typical is the wrong word, institutionalized movement. And this is what, uh, what Simon writes as well. After the Second World War, the bourgeoisie discourse de developed in the interwar years along the lines laid out by Hirsch and his followers, which spoke of women's special gifts and saw Beis Yaakov as a preparatory school for future wives and mothers gained ascendancy. In other words, it's no longer about being a leader, starting a school, you know, be, you know going and doing these, these, these massive movements. Rather, it's about, you know, you want to be a good mother. You want to be a good uh, uh, wife. Um, I saw, this is the ad for the Beis Yaakov of Toronto. It says, when you teach a girl or a daughter, you teach a family. In other words, they're, they're, they're saying explicitly, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is a negative thing, but their value, they're, what they're trying to do is pr um, perpetuate their, the values that we already have in our community. They're, they're, they're trying to 
continue the line, whereas Sarah Schneer was changing and, 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 and revolutionizing the role of the Jewish woman. So, so it's a very different sense. Nevertheless, the memory of Sarah Schneer's life in the early years of Beis Yaakov hinted at and supplied another model of Orthodox womanhood. In these stories, so they still tell the stories, right? They still talk about Sarah Schneer. It's still part of the movement. And these stories, girls and women could be remembered and championed in a range of roles as hikers as well as wives, Torah scholars as well as mothers, pilgrims as well as parents, and writers as well as readers. So um, there are different hints of this. We saw this in the Beis Yaakov Journal. We saw this in Dr. Deutschlander's uh, and, and Rabbi Gershon, uh, Eliezer Gershon Friedensen, and there was in sort of the way that they spoke about the, the women learning is almost as a yeshiva, women studying Torah, the shva, like learning it for its own sake, talking about um, there were lines that they said about women almost as though um, when they learned together and they sang, they became like the Kohen Gadol, different formulations of praising uh, of women's learning and in, in, in praising their different roles. And we see that this is still sort of part of the discourse today that we talk about Sarah Schneer and they talk about her as this ultra, you know, this, this um, institutional figure. At the same time, it's more of a, you know, institutional move, uh, uh, movement's the wrong word, it's an institution. It's to promote its values, it's to continue and perpetuate the traditional values that the community has. It's not sort of this, almost Kiriv, right? What they were doing was like come, getting girls off the streets, trying to, you know, protect them, trying to fight against, you know, human trafficking and prostitution and, and girls not being able to, you know, leaving the fold. Like that's not what Beis Yaakov is doing anymore today. Um, another thing we see in the Beis Yaakov movement, a change from the past to the future, is that it became much more fractured. We see this in, in the American Beis Yaakov, uh, probably most explicitly, um, but it's true in, in, in Israel as well. In Poland, when the Ger Hasidim joined, when the girls, when the Ger families came to Beis Yankov, they came to the one or two schools of Beis Yankov, and they contributed to that culture. They, were, they didn't start their own Beis Yankov. Whereas in America, each sort of Hasidus made the Beis Yankov de Ger, or Beis Yankov of Bells. They started their own schools. So, Whereas Beis Yaakov used to be more of a community, uh, uh, I wouldn't even say it's a com- it was a community school. It was its own culture, as we mentioned many times, that they created their own community. It was Beis Yaakov, right? It was, it was this sort of Hasidus, pseudo Hasidus, pseudo family that they created. And it wasn't like, well, Ger has to have the Ger Beis Yaakov, and Vizhnitz has to have the Vizhnitz Beis Yaakov. And every Beis Yaakov has its own flavor today because. Beis Yaakov is no longer this overarching movement. It's no, no, no longer this sort of revolution and, and defining its own culture. Beis Yaakov is rather almost so ubiquitous because it has become part of the institution, probably more than any other uh, institution in the from world, right? The, the, the Beis Yaakov, you have Beis Yaakov in the West Bank, you have Beis Yaakov in Brazil, you have Beis Yaakov in Borough Park, you have Beis Yaakov in all the different communities. You know, it, it doesn't span every community, but probably in, it's one of the most far-reaching institutions that, is, that has been successful in being a mainstay of the institution. However, it's not, it's, it's, it has certain flavors of the original Beis Yaakov culture, but it no longer is this overarching self-defining culture that we saw in Poland, that we saw in Krakow, that everyone came to Beis Yaakov. You know, the, the bells, came, you know, at the time they, they didn't send, but eventually they did. The, the Ger Hasidim came to Beis Yaakov. The, you know, the, the Lithvish came to Beis Yaakov. Everybody went to Beis Yaakov and they were their own culture. Today we see that perhaps it's part of the fractures of the sort of the American Jewish community. Perhaps it, again, has more to do with the, uh, the, um, the shift that Beis Yaakov underwent, moving from its own culture into sort of an institutional um, entity in its own right. And once it becomes institutionalized, sort of it loses that um, self, you know, the self-contained um, culture. I'll, I'll just conclude 
um, with one last citation from Sarah Schneer herself. And although Dr. Deutschlander, you know, he painted a certain picture of, of, of her, I think her words also are important to hear and how we, how can we understand her balancing these different values of revolution and tradition and how does that, um, and how would that, what, what would that mean for, for a woman today um, who also is, you know, balancing these different multiple roles and expectations. So I'll read to you from what she says. And I think it's still as relevant as it was then. Okay. So this was in 1929 on the eve of the Congress that they had, they called a Benos, you know, Benos World Congress. And Sarah Schneer says, and this is her own journal, I know full well that many of our pious Jews will view this with suspicion. In other words, making a Congress, making a gathering, making a public uh, you know, uh, display. We hold the secret of the ideal of women's modesty, right? She is in the tent and all the glory of the princes within, right? These well-known Pesuk and Kol, Kvodad Bas Melch Panima. And no doubt a portion of the community will regard our Congress with suspicion and fear and see it as a deviation, God forbid, from Israel of old. But these same pious Jews should know that this conference of Orthodox women is a necessary response to the dangers that prey on our sisters from various secular directions. Ace Lassos Lashem. It is a time to act for the Lord. But from this perspective, must our public efforts be understood? And this is said, I, I didn't find a source for this, but it, it, it is said that she had she told her students that they have to always keep two pieces of paper with them in their pocket. It sounds like it's a different story, but this is what they say, that one is right, the uh, internal modesty in the private sphere, and at the same time, that they need, that when the time is for us to defend and to, uh, you know, to do whatever measures have to be done, a time to act, then we have to act. And in a sense, she gains her credibility because she's, she is defending this change because of the damaging, uh, you know, um, dangers that secular society is posing to orthodoxy. So the way that she's able to defend this change may be less um, able to, less relevant in a, in, a, uh, in a more established community where we're not sort of being, you know, fighting these secular influences as much or as, um, you know, the girls that are being going to be Salgov are not dealing with the same struggles that they were dealing with then. Now, and she writes that um, a little further down, our task must also to be to find ways and means to fight for the protection of the Jewish daughter and her moral improvement. So what she's trying to say is that at the end of the day, we need to protect our Jewish daughters. So it's very nice that you're telling me this has never been done. It's never, you know, women's education has never done. And kol kavod abas penima, the women should stay in the sort of the more um, uh, background. But at the end of the day, we have to come out. We have to do this. We have to, you know, change. And we have to understand that if we don't, then we'll, we'll, we will lose our daughters. Now, this was sort of her calling. This was what, what she, you know, we, we, she saw that we must do this, but at the same time, it's not, it was seen as traditional and she's able to balance those two values because she's defending the tradition. She's, she's helping the observance as opposed to, uh, you know, coming from, from without and saying, well, this is, you know, this, we have to get with the times and people aren't doing this anymore. And, and you know, well, women, women are getting an education and therefore we have to give them you know, Torah education, that, that wasn't her approach. Her approach was um, very, I would say, reactive in a sense that this is an issue. Women are, are leaving the fold and we need to, uh, if, and if we don't change, we're, we're going to lose them. So I think, um, you know, a lot of these questions are still open questions. I think it's a fascinating question. The, the questions that Dr. Deutschlander raised about Sarah Schneer herself and how she, well, how she may have felt um, personally, 
Um, he argued she didn't feel any sign of resignation or submission, even though he could imagine that she would have. And I think he was attributing it to her, to her piety, to her true uh, righteousness. Um, but I don't think that, um, you know, that, that may not be true for everyone. And I don't know, you know, I, I obviously I stand in a different place. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. So um, I may look at these things differently, but I, I can't imagine that, that this same tension of finding, finding a, pl a place in a community in which traditional roles don't include, you know, the, there is no yeshiva, you know, there are base yakums, but it's a different, it's a different thing. And, you know, the, you know, how many women have access to gedolim? How many women, you know? So there's many iterations of the same struggle that Dr. Deutschlander was sort of, you know, he was saying it hypothetical and he denied that it was true for Sarah Schneer, but I think it was certainly true. Um, it could certainly be true for, for women today. And um, I don't, you know, I'm still exploring it. And I'm, I think that Sarah Schneer is a tremendous role model for us to sort of strike this balance, but it's not, it's not a simple matter. It's not a simple matter. She was able to do it. And as we noted, it was a special time in history in the interwar period where they had this, you know, this need and this, and this uh, push and the revolutionary tones. Um, and there's a lot to learn about it. There's a lot, as we mentioned, the reflection, I would say, on the partnership between the, the community and the rabbinate was very crucial. And um, I think generally there, we can learn a lot from the, the successes of our history so this is all this is all i have i'm i'm i think that there's you know it's uh it was a pleasure to learn with everyone um and uh i think that's an ongoing question that's what i would say thank you rabbi lesher thank you for coming thanks rabbi lesher my pleasure my pleasure Everyone have a good night. All right. Thank you. Good evening.